This is Julian from AWS. Welcome to episode 8 of my podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to be notified of future episodes. In this episode, I talk to my colleague Segolen. Segolen is a data scientist who works for the ML Solutions Lab inside of AWS. And we talk about machine learning in the trenches. So what does it take to have successful ML projects going from framing the problem to building data sets to picking algos to deploying in production? Lots of really good tips in there. Let's not wait and jump to the discussion. Segolen, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your role at AWS? So thank you, Julian, for having me and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm a data scientist in the Machine Learning Solution Lab at uh, AWS. Um, my team is dedicated to help our customers to uh, do machine learning on AWS. Okay, that's yeah, and that's a big topic. <laughs> that's a big topic, and it's uh, honestly a dream job. Yeah, good, good. And yeah. your are, is your team hiring? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay, okay. So get in touch, right? Yeah. What's the first thing customers need to focus on when they start a machine learning project? Um, I think the first thing is to uh, focus first on the business problems they want to solve and how to uh, frame it. Okay, and um, I, I keep saying the business problem should be something you can write on a whiteboard, something yeah, simple. Is, exactly. is this something you Ex see as well? As, exactly, that's really the simple. You, and this is one thing uh, I always say to customers at the very first step when I meet them is keep it simple, the KISS uh, <laughs> method, you know, the mm -hmm. KISS, <laughs> keep it simple and stupid. That's very important to be able to formulate in a clear manner what you want to solve. Otherwise, uh, that means that the rest of the project will be very hard to solve. Okay, and do you recommend um, identifying key business metrics exactly. that would be improved by exactly. the, the, and this the is, prediction? And this is exactly what we do when we, met, when we meet the customer for the first time. We try to understand what is the uh, business problem they want to solve and after what are the KPIs. Okay. Uh, that's really a, a key word for us. The KPI can, which can be improved by the um, ML or the deep learning model. Okay, so write something simple on the whiteboard with metrics, and then what? What's the next step? Ah, the next step <laughs> is to make your hand dirty and try to see if you have some data to solve this problem. Because sometimes we can see that at some custom, at, uh, with some customers, they have some big problem, but most of the time they don't have the data or they don't know where the data is, etc. So uh, the second step is to understand and to know your data. Okay, and uh, in large companies, I, I suppose this means lots of investigation, discussion, with different teams involved. So who would you need to sit uh, around the table to be successful here? In this case, yeah. I would need some business, some business people, so a stakeholder of the business who knows the, the business, etc. And after some IT guys who know the data and who know the infrastructure. So two kind of people, but the two, these two people are super important uh, when you try to do some ML projects. And how important is it to understand the baseline? What, what I mean here is some machine learning projects are completely new, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of them actually try to replace a manual process or a, a traditional IT system and... Uh, I guess you need to understand that as well, right? Exactly, and sometimes, you know, we have some customers who, want, who say, okay, we want to automate this task, etc., uh, because we know that we've got a lot of human errors. But one of the quick uh, questions I ask them every time is, who is in, in discharge of this manual process? Because once you, after you need to talk with the people in mm -hmm. charge of the manual process, saying, okay, how do you do that, etc., and this is how you can improve uh, the, the, the task when you understand well uh, who is doing what and uh, how is doing what and why uh, there are some um, yeah why error. why they're making mistakes exactly yeah. yeah 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 i think it's it's a good point if if you don't understand how a human does it yeah exactly then how exactly. could you build a model that Exa does it yeah? exactly exactly okay. exactly all right 
And I can see that in, even at very big customer with a lot of data. And sometimes they tell you, yes, uh, we've got like four people in charge of doing that. And you say, oh, wow, okay. And so you need, uh, before doing like some crazy deep learning uh, things on the data, you really need to understand the human uh, behavior uh, okay. before. When you're looking at KPIs that are going to be improved by the model, um, what would be the best practice in uh, trying to improve on those KPIs? Uh, are you looking at a reasonable, you know, let's improve this by 5% or yeah. uh, and, and iterate? Or, or should you be more aggressive and say, ah, come on, let's go for 50%? For my, so from my own experience, it's always better, again, to keep it simple mm. uh, at the beginning. And once you try to, once you see some improvement after, you, that means that you understand the process, you understand how to do that. And after, it would be easier to improve faster uh, the KPIs. But uh, from my point of view, and if, even if some customer want to go fast and saying, okay, I'm going to uh, sell some dreams, and could I use some machine learning everywhere? I think it's good to um, understand the baseline, as you say, and after it is easier to um, okay. comp add some complexity. So set expectations with the with the business yeah. stakeholders, yeah. and uh, and explain that you will iterate. And I think you 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 have to iterate anyway because uh, data discovery is not something you're going to complete in one go. Uh, right? You yeah. always find new sources of data. Exactly. And after, the more you go in your ML project, you, you have some new ideas, some new hypotheses, and you want to test. Uh, this is the reason why at the beginning, you get, it's very important to uh, keep uh, to start with a very simple model. And after, you will see it's like um, it's, it's come from automatically. You've got mm -hmm. new ideas, new data, new people who, are, who want to be involved in this project. And yeah, that's kind of things okay. I see. So iteration, 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 iteration <laughs> yes. and baseline. Okay, good. Um, now let's talk about data sets, mm -hmm. okay? Because they're the, the blood of machine learning models. <laughs> um, what, what best practices would you recommend to customers or what mistakes do you see customers doing on building and curating data sets? Uh, they don't, most sometimes they don't know their data. And uh, one of my uh, first um, recommendation would be spending time uh, to understand where the data come from, why you can have some missing value of bad quality, uh, some errors. Uh, I think that spending the exploratory data analysis is such an important uh, step in any kind of ML model. And after, uh, again, people want to rush into the ML things and say, well, yeah, 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 we are going to do this, but I am. Keep it, take your time. Honestly, it's so, super important. And you know, we, as data scientists, we used to say garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And it's so true because, uh, yeah, mm. if you don't know where your data, if you don't clean it, garbage in and garbage yeah, out. Yeah, well, you know, it, <laughs> it was true in the 70s. Yeah, I but think it's, it's true in the 20s. It's still and like, it will be true in the next exactly, 50s. Exactly, it's so, still uh, the same. I mean, and after, if you, have, if you do some computer vision, if you've got like a lot of noise in your level of the data, I mean, it's important to um, understand the data um, before doing any kind of uh, transformation. As, with some of my previous guests, we discussed uh, the role of the data engineer. Oh, yeah. and how difficult it is to uh, access data for data scientists. So do you see this role as a well-defined role uh, with customers uh, at the moment, or is it still emerging? And what's your opinion on how to be a successful data engineer? So for instance, in my team um, at uh, the Machine Learning Solution Lab, we got different type of profile. Uh, we've got data scientists, pure data scientists like me. We've got some deep learning architects uh, mm -hmm. who are going to create the pipeline, uh, the, full, the full automated pipeline for uh, any kind of ML and DL project. And we've got some position of uh, data engineering. So okay. as you see, we've got three types of uh, ML practitioner mm -hmm. at the ML Solution Lab. And I think these three roles are very um, need them, uh, each other. And data engineering and DLA are really super important and crucial uh, in this um, aspect because otherwise I'm a data scientist. If I don't have access to data, I cannot do anything. So mm -hmm. I really need them. And after, once the data is here, they need to have someone to do the job of uh, making sense of this data. 
So this is important to have this kind of um, two profile. After sometimes that some customer, uh, there is only one guy in charge of everything. Uh, he's like the data scientist, uh, mm. data engineer. Sure. Right? <laughs> and after it's, um, we provide some uh, tools and services to help in this uh, area. Uh, building a data set is never something that gets done. It's, oh, no. it's never over. No, it's never over because um, again, you're going to have some new idea, idea to test, some new, uh, even maybe some new model. And in this kind of model, you would be able to add some other data. So it's like a very iterative process, mm. very dynamic. And that's uh, very uh, nice. Okay, so it's an ongoing activity exactly, and you need yeah. to, to plan for that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's time to try out algos. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and there, it's a maze of algos, yeah. right? From statistical machine learning to deep learning to everything else. So how do you get started here? So um, and, um, that's one of my most important recommendations every time is do a baseline uh, at the beginning. It's like super important. You take the easiest algo or very simple algo. You see what's happened and after you're going to uh, introduce some more complex stuff, some more data, etc. And you're going to compare with the baseline. But Would you even start with a subset of the data and try statistical uh, yeah. algos, you know, logistic regression or something like yeah. that? Just to see, hey, can I get to 80% yeah. accuracy? It's, yeah, for me, it's super important to just play the with the data, doing like the explanatory data analysis in case of um, machine learning, uh, like uh, random forest, etc. to see mm. the distribution of the data. If okay. you've got like a high dispersion, it's super important from my point of view. And then add more features, yeah, try out different, different models, and again, compare with the baseline you get. And you see after where is the improvement, how you can have better performance, what is the, the speed, etc. But again, the very first, and I think most of the, for instance, Amazon Personalized and Amazon Forecast mm -hmm. work like this. You start with a simple model, which is going to be your baseline. And after you're going to try different algorithms, for instance, uh, uh, forecast, you're going to try to do some uh, HPO with DPR, etc. Mm -hmm. But the very important stuff is to have baseline okay so again yeah convince yourself you have something yeah. interesting and then you can unleash um, a, a collection of algos and do uh, hyper parameter tuning and of course tooling is important here yeah. because you don't want to do that stuff manually oh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but sometimes at the beginning it's important to do manually some stuff and yeah manual exploration yeah, manual and, then, exploration and, then and after exactly that's uh, okay increase and so w when do you know it's time to stop when you are tired, <laughs> when you think, when you dream about that during the night, uh, and, and, that's, and you say, okay, now no, I'm done, it drives yeah. me crazy. Now, I think after, um, that's the difference between uh, pure research and uh, business. Mm. Uh, you know, prior to join AWS, I was a pure researcher. I could spend months just to improve by 1% or 2% one model. And in business, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if you are at 60 or 70% of accuracy, you won't spend another eight weeks to just go, go to seven, 72% of accuracy. So I think at one point, you know, it's like the human uh, stuff uh, in, important in the, um, I, um, in the machine and deep learning project is that at one point you say, okay, I'm agree, it could be perfect, it is not, but it will work and I will monitor and I will retrain mm -hmm. and I will see how it works uh, in the future. And also you can, uh, for, for some workflows, you can have a human in the loop, right? Yeah, of course. So you could say, well, this is only 73% accurate, but there's a human in the loop to, to monitor, to monitor and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, catch whatever. That's super important yeah. to have human in the loop. And yeah, because after you put in, pro pro in production, some customers say, okay, now it's done, the, dev the job is done. And you're like, no, the job is not done. Please keep it someone uh, inside the loop because otherwise you don't know if the, the performance decreases and you don't, uh, it's super important to have someone who take care about the uh, algorithm, the production. So once you reach the accuracy level that is good enough mm -hmm. for your uh, for your business, you have to deploy huh. in production. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I keep saying this is actually the hardest part mm. yeah. and the most dangerous part. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you agree? Oh, so oh tell God. us uh, tell us about. <laughs> Uh, customer stories and uh, horror stories. Horror story, I think that yeah, you put into 
production some model without having uh, having done some A/B testing before, mm. and you have some customer who call you saying, "What's happened? What's happened?" And you're like, "Oh my God!" So uh, no, it's very tricky, and you need again to uh, um, be very very picky on each step of the productionalization of your mm -hmm. uh, model. Uh, you need to be, to be careful about how the data are going to be ingest, uh, what kind of, of uh, metrics you can have to follow and to understand uh, the pipeline of the ingestion of the data. Um, and after we've got, of course, like some um, service like SageMaker, which help you to uh, deploy and put into production mm. in one click. But after uh, you need to uh, take care. It's very, uh, very kind of manual stuff to, mm. uh, yes, to be sure that your cloud watch, your step function works well, the output. So yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I asked the question to again, one of my previous guests saying, uh, how soon can we, we you know, one-click deploy and forget about it? Uh, <laughs> we're like, well, not, not right now. No, and, uh, not right now. And, uh, and I right think it, it would not be a good idea because mm. it's important to keep control of the thing. Otherwise, and again, data can uh, evolve a lot in a very short time, uh, timely manner. And it's super important to, yeah, to keep an eye and to, be, to keep a touch. And, uh, yeah, data drift and uh, you know, oh, missing yeah. features oh, or yeah, yeah, yeah. something upstream that corrupts the data oh, that yeah, is sent exactly. to the model. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. There are a million things that can go wrong. Data drift, yeah, that's and, one uh, of the Yeah, and SageMaker model monitor is, yeah. uh, is how we try to solve that problem. Exactly. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, but production is, is the hardest. Thing. Oh, yeah, that's super hard. But after you can do, and once it is in production, it's super cool because you see that all the done, all the job you have done for uh, so many months, etc. Now it's real, it's life, mm -hmm. and you're like, wow. Yeah, and cool. you can look at your KPIs yeah, yeah. and and show that the improvement is real because uh, you know, in my experience, the the data science sandbox is one thing. Yeah. And you know, you run your A/B test and you try to do it well, and then. It's like, wow, it works and everybody is very excited and you put it in production and it doesn't work the way mm -hmm. you expected it to work mm -hmm. because data is a little bit different. I don't know, latency is a little bit different, whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that the truth lies in production. And, uh, yeah, exactly. and if you can replicate in production the results you had in the sandbox, then congratulations, yeah. it's not easy, right? No, that's not easy at all. But after again, it's like when, when it's uh, the, all the job done by the data engineering uh, part, uh, the data scientists uh, became, become uh, real because mm -hmm. uh, people can see and this is what um, people who are not experts in the area are just business uh, driver. They can touch, they can say, okay, we can use this kind of uh, app and we can see the improvement. And people say, okay, and business understand uh, the IT part is super proud. Yeah, and I think it's, I, I meet a lot of customers who say, well, we built a POC and yeah. it works and we stop there. Mm. And I'm always saying, well, why don't you go and push that POC in production, even if it's only limited production? Because exactly what you said, until you show the business guys uh, that, hey, this metric is improving, uh, it, it'll be just, okay, nice, you know, yeah. nice, so what? Mm -mm -mm. Well, that's what, right? Exactly. So a POC, to me, needs to go into production at some point, yeah. under under full control, etc. But if it doesn't end in production, I think you just uh, did half the job. Yeah, exactly. And it's like part of research. And mm -hmm. this is one sentiment I see, uh, one feeling I see with a lot of data scientists. They say, OK, we are in a room, or we are in a tower somewhere, we, d we do some code, and nobody uh, look at the code, and nobody understands what we do. And this is, yeah, I think when you do the POC and you put it into production and you put it live, people understand uh, the work and understand the power, the, of value, the, yeah. the value, et cetera. Yeah. All right, we could go on for three hours, uh, <laughs> so but we're almost out of time. So um, let's play the top three games. So top three things that uh, are important for a machine learning project to succeed. Uh, data, <laughs> people, um, business uh, outcome. Okay, great. 
Now, top three things that kill ML projects. Data, <laughs> people, <laughs> business outcome. I mean, if you don't have a, a good business outcome, yeah. pres, uh, di, uh, well defined, people won't be motivated and won't try to find the good data. On the other side, if you have a super uh, business outcome with some super motivated people, with pe uh, business people involved, plus good data directly or in indirectly related to the uh, ML project, you will succeed. So okay, and if you need help, the ML Solutions Lab, <laughs> you know, Segoren and the, and the rest of the team, which is amazing, <laughs> are here to help. So, you know, get in touch. Thank you very, very much no, for sharing the, the real life stories and the real life advice for customers and everybody else. Much appreciated. And, uh, you know, I wish you many successful projects. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. <laughs>